as I told you, we, these are just illustrations of what Barnard College women did during the 1968 era. But the way this is going to kind of reveal what these individuals have done and also your own reflections is we're going to have um, like three or four minutes for each one of them to answer a set of uh, answer a question and share with you their experience now that you know who they are and then we'll have a kind of two-part Q&A. One part is you got I hope index cards for write down, writing down your questions to kind of gather them together and the other part is please comment and question us, please, and each other. Okay, that's how it's uh, gonna be set up. If um, I may, I'm going to uh, share the question that each person has thought a little bit about uh, and give, you, give them uh, a chance to answer. What were the political, cultural, social and economic issues that concerned you the most during the 1968 era? And in what ways did you express your concern at that time? Please. If okay, want, if all right. Uh, as you wish. You, you want to go ahead? Uh, if you, if you, if anyway, you would, we'll please. Please. <laughs> if you would. Uh, uh, Grace, Grace, you can start. Okay, all right. Well, I already said that I was really concerned about gender. Um, and that's obvious. Um, I also had been involved with the anti-war movement since I came to New York, and um, particularly with the pacifist anti-war movement, um, and was involved a lot with uh, the War Resisters League and all of those um, organizations, and part of the war, anti-war movement here on campus. I was really not happy about the culture of, of that of our anti-war movement on campus, and particularly how activism was defined was so limited. And I think, I think one of the gifts of the involvement of, of women in all of these things is to expand the, our understanding of what it is that we're doing, to include not only conceptual, because certainly we can be conceptual, but also how the, what the impacts are of these things as they play out on the ground, um, in people's lives, and bring that information in. So, um, what am I supposed to be talking about? Well, <laughs> those, those were the concerns. Oh, yeah. What was I involved with? Yeah, those were the Sorry. concerns. So, um, I was in, I came to Barnard and I was just, a, you know, going about my business, sort of, except for I didn't want to live on campus. So, I went across to, over there to the Earl, what is that called, Earl Hall? And we, and my boyfriend Peter and I talked to the rabbi and the Episcopal priest, Bill Starr and, and Bruce Goldman, and we said, what do we do? We need to live together. We have a mimeograph machine. We're making leaflets, and we, we have all this stuff to do. And, and they said, well, then you have to lie. And we're like, what? So I created this fiction for myself about where I was living, which apparently many other Barnard students had created a like fiction for themselves. But then Judy Clemens Rood, who was a reporter for the New York Times, mm -hmm. as part of her own empowerment, she wrote an article. She was trying, she was an up-and-coming woman on the, you know, woman reporter, one of the few. And she did an article on cohabitation um, that we were in, and I said, I have, it's fine, I'll be in this, but I need to be anonymous. And she said, no problem. Well, she changed my first name, and that was all. So the dean of students said, Dear, just tell us it isn't you. The alumni are up in arms. So, I, so I said, it is, you know. Um, and that was the beginning of this whole process of my um, getting ending up getting kicked out. So, the first thing that happened was that the day of the trial, we had a trial. They used to have these. Um, things where you'd, when they, someone violated the rules, they would have a, a, a private, private, otherwise known as secret, court of faculty, staff, faculty administrators, and students. Um, but I said, it has to be public. It's a violation of my civil rights. So, <laughs> so we had, they made it public for Barnard students plus my boyfriend, Peter. And, <laughs> and the, the thing that happened that was so amazing is the morning of the thing, 
I walked onto the campus and there's a sea for, it looked like a sea then, of television with those reflectors and all that stuff. They were all there and they're interviewing me. And suddenly I had to learn to be a different person than I was. I was just one young woman, I was 20 years old, and suddenly I had to speak for myself for what I was doing on a level that no one had ever really showed me or told me how to do. And I think an important thing that I want to share is how possible that is and how important it is to be able to do that and how much more support I think there is now for that, but that it's really still not complete. One, One more minute. Okay, so the whole conversation in the media was about the, is this about sex or is this about freedom? Is this about sex or is this about power? And guess what the media guys primarily thought it about. So I became this sex, power, scary, allure, you know, and to the extent that there was a reporter from the Life magazine, they did a thing on Life magazine about this, and his puzzle was, if she's a sex person, how come she's not more alluring? <laughs> <laughs> That's ugly. I'm sorry. That's ugly. <laughs> so, and then the wow. one other thing I want to say is that I didn't know about intersectionality, and what this really was, was this was intersectionality that didn't happen. Martha Peterson, who was the president of Columbia at that, of Barnard at that time, was herself a closeted lesbian. And, and so I was her, for her worst nightmare. I was talking about sex in public and freedom at a time that she was her first year here and she was in a capital campaign. So, <laughs> I don't know what that's like. <laughs> I have a lot of respect and compassion for her at this point, I, less than. than <laughs> so the outcome of it is that uh, there were the same kind of things were happening elsewhere. And by the end of the summer of 1968, ho housing curfews and in loco parentis were basically gone. So, mine is a story about uh, what being really active can do in terms of transforming the way you look at things. As, I, as you heard me say, I came from a long line of um, activists both in Europe and here. Uh, and I have a couple of themes here. One is my relationship to my Barney sisters, my closest friends, um, with whom I was living in Green Hall, uh, uh, who wanted me to leave my building. I was a fair woman. Um, and so the, the struggle is to be strong uh, for what you care about when your friends care differently or have different politics, anyway. even in a very liberal institution like this, was one of my earliest experiences. Like many of you, I read Mary McCarthy's group and I had these four friends and we were very intimate and I loved them to pieces and we had plans about how we were going to develop interdisciplinary practices in law, medicine, psychiatry, and social work. And we were <laughs> visionary, mm -hmm. but when I went into a building, um, they really tried to talk me out of it. You know, this is not something you should be doing. And so it was a very important process of individuation for me to realize what was very important to me. And I just want to quickly mention that, what was it, uh, it must have been seven years ago, our reunion must have been the 40th, mm -hmm. uh, when we came together to watch the film that one of our classmates has made about 68, um, I was seated with those friends, and they all said, I don't want to talk about this stuff that happened in 68. I wasn't involved in it. And we began, instead of having a wonderful, warm reunion, actually recapitulating those cleavages um, of all those years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was very painful for me, because I defended, and I still do everything I did in 1968 <laughs> and beyond, uh, and they've all had wonderful lives and contributed many things also, but um, these things don't change. So for those of us up here, all of us have remained activists, and it's not easy. The second point I want to make about my own experience, this is sort of getting into question two, so you can skip me on the next round if you want. <laughs> um, I was in Fairweather, and Fairweather not only had women, but it had the reputation at one point of being the most radical. Hmm. Um, 
there was a lot of discussion of strategy. You know, were we going to blow things up? We didn't. The weatherman did that later. Um, and that's when I quit as a pacifist. Uh, but there was a lot of talk about strategy. Some of it was quite radical about destroying things in the buildings. Um, and so uh, having a, a voice of uh, trying to accomplish change and also doing it in a way that was actually going to make a difference has remained part of my life. I wound up leaving Fairweather, leaving the building when I was upset with some of the discussion of slightly more violent activities or more radical activities. I knew I wanted to go to law school, so I suspected I also, I will own up to this now, had some concerns about being arrested, and many of the people here, both in the audience and up here, were arrested. I was not. What I did do, and has stayed with me my entire life, was I don't know if anybody in the audience was part of this group. About 200 of us, hearing rumors that the police were going to be called by Grace and Kirk, decided to take our sleeping bags um, and sleep in front of each of the buildings on the naive assumption that the president of Columbia University would never call the police on us innocent demonstrators. Um, and so for uh, three nights, I believe, I slept uh, in a sleeping bag outside the buildings. And as an academic, I've come back here many times to give talks, and I visit my bricks. Mm. My, the bricks that I slept on were a touchstone. Um, some, a few years after that, I became a mediator, and I do a lot of peace work throughout the world. I've just come back from Israel, um, as well as mediation work in the United States. And often when people ask me, how did I become a mediator, I refer back to that period. Uh, and I want to say I'm an activist mediator. That's what happened from sleeping on the bricks. I was inside the building. I believed in all the demands. I always thought there were seven demands, and I was trying to remember them uh, before today, so I'm glad we have this document about the six demands. But um, I was there to protect the people, as a lawyer does, protect the people that are further out from those of us that are still working within the system. Um, and I went back and forth between being in the system and out of the system, um, but I didn't want to um, lose my ability to represent those that were taking more radical actions that I believed in. And I also wanted to be able to have the ability professionally to protect them. And as you heard me say, my grandfather shot off his pen. I come from a long line of pacifists. And so I still believe in activism. And I also believe, as I think Grace does too, that it's best to start with peaceful focuses and to try to figure out um, how all the parties together might possibly accomplish what they're trying to do together. And so um, that was a, a crucible experience for me to be sleeping on those bricks and to realize that in any movement, any so this is the third question, any social movement <laughs> or any political movement for any of the, the younger women in the audience, movements need lots of people to, to perform many different functions. Someone does have to do the posters. Someone does have to make the coffee. Someone has to do the strategizing. And then someone has to think about how to be effective and how to actually get things done. And so there are many roles in a social movement. And for me, it was very important because I found my own voice, that is arguing with my Barnett classmates who didn't want me to participate at all, but also leaving a building and doing something else um, in the movement. And so uh, for me, it was a very, very, very significant experience. And it stayed with me all my life. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to start by commenting how rich women's lives are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope we have uh, a deep appreciation of this. Um, for myself, uh, I'm involved with not one but two very accessible mediums. Uh, the first being photography, which is a area specialty for me. And the other area, of course, being publications and books. And <clears throat> I will bet that there's no one in this room that hasn't held a book in their hands. <laughs> Unlike our president. And <laughs> well, that's outside this room. Uh, there's no one here who hasn't wandered into a gallery who doesn't have pictures over their piano, perhaps, or next to their bedside, or know a favored painter, or responded to the beauty of uh, a morning sunrise. So I, I think that there are elements here that are intersect, and we're paying closer and closer attention to this. My specific interest 
was in black arts because I knew so little about it when I came to Barnard. And I found so few courses uh, willing to address it that I lifted my uh, heels and went across the street. And there I found a wonderful professor uh, who uh, was teaching not what was then called non-Western art. <laughs> non -Western. Uh, his father was a, a specialist in Greek and Roman classical, and this was the perfect rebellion for him. <laughs> and I really dug that. I, I understood that completely. And uh, so uh, I kind of camped out at Columbia in art history in this very specialized field. At that time, there were five of us in the nation who were studying it. And uh, the entire culture has come 50 years later to embrace much of what we uncovered about the philosophy and aesthetics, the cultural ethics of other people. And I think we still have very deep lessons to learn from these, these fields of study before this culture destroys them. So I think there is a, a, a lesson to learn, but it always devolves into a personal lesson. So here's my personal lesson. Mm. By the way, before I start that, I do want to say that uh, when you're an activist, uh, you kind of know it. And if you're not an activist, you also kind of know it. And that's OK. I just want to let people know it's OK to be in that place. But I also want to say to these women on the panel, I want to ask you if anyone has ever thanked you for your service to humanity. And I'd like to do so, you know, for Thank myself. You back. Thank you. Back. Thank you back. The other part of that statement is that when you are an activist, you will be punished. Yes. And you, you will feel the pain. And we have all experienced that in many discreet ways, but we have also all overcome it. And we're here, you know, to, to send a message to you. It's possible to survive. So um, I was uh, given the lowly uh, task of raising money for the black students in, in uh, Hamilton Hall. We had no money. Pa parents were not yet organized. There was such confusion. Uh, but they knew one thing had to be done. You had to stick those chairs in the handles to the door so that nobody could get out and nobody could get in. And um, I, the one exception, well, not exception, but early exception to that was the, uh, the mixture, the mixture of black and white students in Hamilton Hall and in the initial um, protests um, at the sundial. So uh, I wanted to say that when it resolved a little bit, um, the white students left and I did want to say very, very deliberately, because I know there are feelings on both sides of the question, but that the black students cheered that. And uh, they felt supported. And uh, that was a very critical and important issue. Um, it doesn't happen often. And uh, so anyway, after that, I was assigned the task of raising money. I said, well. Where do I go to raise money from? I mean, the campus is closed down. I can't go to the president's office and ask him for money. And they said, well, just go out there, Amsterdam Avenue. Just, just stand by the gate with, 
which I did. <laughs> Wondering why am I here in the dark of night, you know, <laughs> holding a can. <laughs> but anyway, I saw a shadowy figure approaching, you know, uh, Amsterdam Avenue is on a slight incline. Mm -hmm. And it's a little hard to get up. And this guy, or whatever the person was, I couldn't really identify, was work working their way slowly up. Uh, with great difficulty, and I thought it was a little odd, but um, I was so filled with the fervor of the moment, which is the, the, the hive of the activist, really, uh, that it sustains you against all other things, uh, that uh, I failed to pick up on certain cues about the figure, and I just saw him, ah, my first customer. You know, I just, <laughs> so I, the, he got a little closer and I realized it was the man. It was an elderly man. And he was dressed uh, very um, plainly, we, we might say. And uh, I approached him as he slowly did this walk up Amsterdam. And I held out the can and I said, excuse me, sir. Would you care to contribute to the black students? We've occupied the campus and we're shutting it down. And we're very angry in my, what would you call it, broken English? We're very angry that they are trying to take over this park in Harlem, which belongs to you. And uh, so as I was lecturing him slowly, <laughs> I came to realize that he was staring at me with what I could only call this big twinkle in his eyes. <laughs> he was maybe 70, 80 years old. Uh, he was not homeless, but maybe he was close to it. And all of a sudden I realized this is the person I'm fighting for. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be asking him to support the students. So at the point, I started to back away and I said, but you know, it's okay. Just tell your friends and relatives and you know, that we're out here and we need your support. And uh, thank you very much. And as I was doing this, he reached into his pocket and he said, pulled out a bill. And he said, well, here's my, here's, here's my contribution. And he said, this is my last dollar. <gasps> but I want you to have it. Wow. Mm. And I've thought about this exchange in this moment for many, many years. It has a lot of lessons in it for me. And uh, the perils and the pride of being an activist and uh, the waters we wade into that are so deep and so interconnected at the same time. It's like people, you know, we're different, but we're all human beings. Thank you. And your concerns and what you have learned and things that we could learn from. What um, I was hoping we'd be able to do is move on to a couple of the questions and then uh, try to get as close as we can to that exchange that we were looking for. Uh, it's much appreciated, everything that you've offered, and we have important illustrations and very different perspectives on the intersection of the causes and the actions, the, uh, uh, the notion of operations within an organization when you want to support change, the notion that there are institutions that will support you and then you will receive the resistance of ins institutions and individuals who will try to suppress your request, including your demands for new changes as well as strategy. Um, they have represented the best among us uh, in, in, in many ways, but uh, we want to get to, uh, let's say, let, when we do a question, the last question, Nancy, and then move on Nancy to... Nancy didn't get the Nancy. Oh, Nancy. I'm, Honestly, it's okay. I didn't. I needed to catch my breath for a little bit after well, hearing Well, I was so going to say we can end 
you yeah. know, we, can, we can continue with yours yeah. and then get to the, the, the mm. rest of it. I'm happy to sort of like compress what I was going to say into sort of like the last question. I didn't really um, know how I was going to do it, so thank you for the opportunity to do that. I, I just want to, you know, echo a little bit of what um, Grace was talking about, um, and I guess to some degree everybody here. I mean, it, it was really hard um, to be a woman in 1968 and an activist. Um, and I, I talked about this a lot, I've written about it a lot. Um, um, I've been involved in every decade anniversary of, the, of 1968, you know, really since 1978. Um, and I, I wanna say, because I, I want her to be mentioned here tonight, that I'm, I feel like I'm here because, primarily because of Andrea Egan. Um, Andrea, Andrea was um, a woman activist. She passed away probably 20 years ago, but she was she with her then boyfriend uh, was married um, in Fairweather Hall and uh, by the campus minister who declared them children of the new age. And it was a beautiful candlelit ceremony with you know everybody around and. So after that, you know, Andrea and I kind of worked a lot on, you know, kind of starting this reunion process. And when she, she had cancer and she died from it, but she made me promise her that I would hang in. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she said to me, look, you know, we've got to keep, the, you know, we've got to keep our voices out there. And, you know, we were at that time, two of us in a room with all men from 1968, and this was in 1978, and again in 1988. Um, and, you know, I said, she said, oh, you're a lawyer, you know how to speak, you know, you're not afraid of standing up on your two feet. And so I did promise her that I would do that. And I feel like on her behalf, as well as mine and other women who don't have the opportunity to talk about these things now, um, because they're not here, um, I do want to say that um, it's important to understand, you know, this, the, um, the intersection of humiliation and exhilaration. Mm -hmm. And that is what I felt, and that is what a lot of people felt. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at Kathy Seal um, in the audience. Kathy and I went to high school together. And I realized when I saw Kathy yesterday that I came here, I came to college, you know, a pretty self-confident young woman. I had a very, like you, you know, political, egalitarian family. I didn't have any brothers, only had a sister. You know, we were raised to do anything. And I came here feeling like I could. And I discovered that despite my ideas, despite my activism, you know, despite my intelligence and persistence and all these things, you know, we became, I became a girlfriend, a note taker and a coffee maker. <laughs> and, and so, it, you know, this was the way it was. And Catherine sort of has given us sort of like an overview of the times and, you know, others can comment, you know, from a, you know, you can, I'm sure. Um, you know, when, when the second wave of feminism really hit, let me assure you, it was not until after the spring of 1968. Mm. So we were on the cusp of something, something was happening. We didn't know what it was, but we were thrilled to be, I was arrested. We were thrilled to be involved. I said on the conference call we all had before this conference, you know, when people asked me what I was doing, I said, well, you know, had there been women leaders of SDS at the time. I would have been one. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact is, were, there you weren't, were. and I wasn't. You were, and, you, you know, I think all I would speak personally is sort of like my segue to the rest to the last question. It, you know, on some, at, on some, some level, ever since, I, you know, this has been part of my life and, you know, shaping who I became. I became a lawyer because I wanted to buttress my, uh, my self-confidence, I wanted to learn how to speak on my feet and never again to feel that I was relegated to a role that, you know, just felt really inconsistent at the time with who I was. So that's how I'd like to leave this, this point. Thank you.